Um, so I am uh, Scott Moser. I'm an employee of Canonical. I work for I work for Canonical. I work on a bunch of server um, and cloud, uh, those sorts of products. Um, I'm on the Ubuntu server team, and so if you used Ubuntu, probably run through some code that I <laughs> contributed or edited or broke. So um, tonight's talk is about shell programming or shell scripting. There. So generally, I talk about why why would you want to do shell programming, how to take it uh, from what is a script to a program and some tips and then take questions. So, so there's, that's uh, the very popular thing I've seen before, um, go away or I'll replace you with a shell script. I think a lot of us have gotten our first introduction to programming or at least shell programming you know, in, in a similar way of, you know, had a series of commands that you ran and then just wanted to run those all one after another. And so, and put some logic in, and then it just kind of grows iteratively, and then a lot of times you end up with a with a larger script. Um, so, I think that a lot of people now will consider that shell has kind of had its day, and we are past that. Um, you know, previously init scripts were written in shell. Um, you know, system five init was pure bin sh replaced largely by upstart and then system D and things like that where shell kind of was was being torn at the edges. Um, so a lot of people you may think that shell is kind of done. I there is a lot of there is still a lot of places for shell um, and it, it honestly solves a lot of problems simply and you know probably when you're interacting with your computer at least on you know most, I think probably most of the audience here interacting with computer involves interacting with a shell. So familiarity with that actually just kind of goes into programming of it and kind of makes its way back to your interacting with a shell. As when I sit at a shell, a lot of times I'll actually write, you know, for loops and things, just type them at the command line. Well, uh, when you say shell, you mean the command line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. My, my shell. Ah, come on now. Ubuntu's default is bash. I mean that. Yeah. So that's bash. You know, these are all. Those are all shell commands um, that are interpreted by your shell. And so you know, you can do. Um, that's shell programming in a sense, right? I just told it to iterate a loop over each one of those things, and that right there is, I think, the sort of program that the first that you write the first time you interact with shell, and then you realize that that right there has like six gotchas. In it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. How do I get back to that? Okay. So why why do you want why would you want to use shell? versus Python or Perl or Ruby or C or um, Go. You know, um, shell is very fast. Um, you can, you know, a lot of people may, you, you may think that it's not, um, but in a lot of cases it is, it is very fast. And the, the benefit, uh, go back. So this is a uh, here. I wanted to show kind of startup performance of different programs. Um, if, you, if you're going to write a program in in Perl or Python or Bash or Ruby, you're going to incur the first thing you do or, or Java. Java is a famous one. I should have put that here. Yeah, it would have been fine. Um, but you, you incur the overhead of just of loading the program off disk into memory you know, and going through its initialization routines to get somewhere before you can do anything. So this is just looping through uh, a thousand times invocation of each of these programs from bin true to bin sh to bin bash, Perl, Python, two, three. 
Um, actually, then, rather than... Um, no. No. The yeah. shell corn shell is SH. So you're, they yeah, so... Well, they might. Well, you're probably not by default. Um, yeah. Ben SH is dash. That was actually changed in Ubuntu in 2006, I think, and primarily for the for the reason of boot is slow. Um, because bash is significantly heavier than dash, um, and other uh, and other POSIX um, compatible shell, just because it's got a lot more features, it's it's bigger. Um, so let's see. Here's an example output. I can run this, but once we get down to the bottom there, ah, uh, thought I could, no, well, I must have failed. Ruby, Ruby doesn't really run that fast. I didn't have it when I ran the program. Ruby's <laughs> fast. Um, so you can see, like, so, so the built-in, the built-in to shell colon, which is basically a, you know a shell built-in for true, essentially is looped through a thousand, a thousand iterations of that. And, Three thousand per second. Um, invoking the program slash bin slash true and going through the, the LD, you know, the loader, loading the thing, pulling it off the disk. After you know the second time it runs, it's in the it's in memory. So this is getting rid of that. But still, just invoke true took a, roughly a thousandth of a second each time, right? Um, and then SH is is very close to true. To do sh, to do fork to sh, that, let's see, go back to what that is. Um, so that is um, bin sh. So the second one, bin sh minus c, is, that differs from the first one because on the first one all we do is we stay in the same shell. Mm -hmm. And then the third one here is actually we, in, we, we invoked a program and told it to do nothing. Basically, said no one, and so that's what I did with the other things too. Um, and so you see that you know the overhead of inv invoking even Perl is is dramatically more than Bash, and then once you go to Python and Python three, mm -hmm. it gets laughable. I mean, to, to the overhead of invoking a program. So that's PHP in there. Um, I doubt I have PHP. Easily installed anywhere that I can tell you, but um, okay. but I mean it's really yeah. If you just invoke, I would I would suspect that PHP exit is somewhere between Perl and Python. That's my guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but if I write something in PHP, I'm not going to write it in shell. No, what I'm saying is if if you if you invoke the the cost of invoking of a program of Invoking PHP, yeah, it, there's a cost to that, right? And so every time there are ways around getting incurring that cost in a web server, but essentially every time you know a web server hit comes in, PHP goes through its initialization processes and starts reading code. And if the first thing is exit, already it has done a hell of a lot of work. Yeah. The computer has done a hell of a lot of work at that point, and. It, it's done a lot more than like to run slash bin and slash sh. So yeah, trying to show that the 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 cost incurred in invoking an interpreter basically is what I'm trying to show here. Um, basically, I think what you're saying is that if you need to use the interpreter because of what you're doing, the sophistication of it, or whatever, uh, go for it. But if you're just trying to do something simple. It's yeah. so fast in shell that by the time right. that the whole thing can be done yeah. in less time than it would take to start the other thing. Yeah, so. Simple French apps don't do any high time. Right. Well, it, it just depends. I mean, I said simple French apps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here I've done. So can I have HTML submit to a, to a shell script then? Well, of a key, no, essentially. So every time, every time your, web, your web server takes a hit. It, it invokes fast CGI or other things get around this, but essentially user bin PHP comes off of disk, it's loaded into memory, a whole bunch of operations happen, and then it starts reading 
your PHP snippet, right? And until that PHP snippet happens, yeah, shell is not a replacement for PHP, but the interpreter, but let's see, but PHP is an interpreter, and there was a lot of cost to getting to it to interpret the right. So if you and, can get, and you could write CGI scripts in shell if you want. Yes. Yeah. And then the fork overhead. Um, so I was, so also, one one other point on that last thing I wanted to say, show is that, the, let's see, a lot of this, yeah, so actually, so most of this is just simply the overhead of fork. Because you can imagine, bin true is pretty lean on <laughs> code that it's executing, right? But every time you fork a process, you incur an overhead because the, the loader comes up and loads a bunch of shared libraries into place, da da da, da all this stuff. And the second, you know, in the, the subsequent 999 times that I ran that true, they didn't actually hit disk. They came out of the Linux file system cache, right? So all that stuff was all cache. If you're going to run a program, the, the, the biggest place that I'm annoyed by bad shell programs or Python in my path is when there's a server, when I when I have to go to a system and it's performing poorly, meaning it's out of memory or it's disk IO is crashed, right? And that means when I SSH in, any program that's in my way means it has to get loaded out of swap mm -hmm. or something, or bin, you know, bin, bin SH has to get loaded off disk. Most likely bin, bin SH never leaves memory. but Perl and Python and Ruby, those things, and all the all those things will then incur file system hits, actually off of disk. And so, if you're trying to help to fix a dying server, all of those things aren't helping you. <laughs> if they're in, if they're in your um, critical path, it's not helpful. Your profile, your yes, your right. All of that stuff is bad. And yeah. and <laughs> under my opinion, pretty. I, Ubuntu has more stuff in the critical path to log in than it should. And you'll notice that if, seriously, I mean, if you're swapping on a system and your load is high, you'll see why is this taking so long to put a dollar sign in front of it. Yeah. You know, so I can, so so I can, can try to fix again. this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this was actually, I, I have done, I, my experience of, and I have way too much experience with shell programming and trying to do things in uh, small environments. Um, I've written a, in an ramfs similar to Debian's, the, you know, an init ramfs builder and you know, a root finder and all those sorts of things. And typically, and then I've also done Cirrus, which is this tiny little basically in an init, init ramfs that acts as a cloud image so that you can test OpenStack and test different things by booting something up, SSHing in and verifying it's there. Um, and so this, this came out of me actually trying to do um, to to do a, to do something in Cirrus, and I, I'm just I want to make it really fast and to not be annoying to people because the whole intent of it of Cirrus is boot it, verify it's there, and, and kill it. You want to do as many as you can, and you want them to happen super fast. It, it doesn't serve much purpose outside of that. But anyway, um, so I had I was looking for. We wanted to see how fast you, or we wanted to try to get some information out of dmessage that the kernel prints and it goes in its running buffer and want to get it out. So um, we, if somebody wrote something and I said, well, that's going to be slow. Um, and I tried to make it faster. And let's see, how's that? Let's see. Let's see, yeah, I'm down here further. So this was, the first one was just, D, was a D message piped into grip. Um, yeah. So it was something like that. Yeah. Maybe he went from bar log sys log or something. He grab that, pipe it into aug. And I said, well, you don't need to do the grep because you have off and you can do the shell parsing or you can do the you can you know do the, the regular expression yeah matching in off um, 
and it turned out I was I was really surprised at the results on this um, because it turns out that grep is really fast, <laughs> <laughs> and so grep beat in this when I just did pure awe, which I which incurred only one four um, versus let's see line fifteen there. Um, Grep piped into awk was actually faster than just awk. So the cost of the fork was negligible compared to how much better grep was at just doing the regular expression matching. Wow. It's kind of things that you you find that are I wouldn't have thought you, that I most of the time I basically avoid fork. And on Linux, this is the case. I suspect if you ran this on any other Unix you'd see inverted results. That fork, because fork is so fast on Linux compared to AIX and or compared to other Unixes. What about it's, BSD? I suspect that it's not as well optimized on anything other than Linux. Mm -hmm. You, and so I think a lot of people get to the, you see a lot of people with shell scripts that they did on Linux and they fork, 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 and they don't realize the cost of that because Linux made it magic. And if they ran it elsewhere, you would be you would like watch. You would be it would be so much slower. Um, anyway, so let's see. We'll go on. So even even Bash is is pretty fast to start up, and especially on Linux, the likely the fact is that. For better or for worse, bin bash and bin sh are probably never leaving the file system cache. They are always there, um, and their their libraries are always going to be loaded. Um, so yeah, so the reason you you care about that overhead is because if your system load is 200 and you're trying to figure out what's going on, it matters. Um, tab completion is another thing where people where you may I don't know. There are some very slow tab completion programs that you may have run run into if you if you're typing something, hit tab tab, and, and it just sits there. <laughs> What's going on? There are tab completion programs that are, you know, in, that are doing hundreds of forks and are just doing poor programming to get there. And if you improve those things, you you won't be annoyed by tab completion too much. <laughs> um, it's just lots of little things where you know. You you end up doing you end up doing something thousands of times, and it didn't seem like a big deal when something happened a couple times, but um, scale comes into play. And then boot time. Um, I was surprised that I had seen this before, and I wasn't really surprised because I've done a lot of innate RAMFS programming. Um, in a cloud image, now this is a very simplistic world where basically <coughs> I know what root is, we're just going to find the, the root device and mount it. I, I did a replace of sbin init with a program that just said echo what pin, or you know, that, that created a pin and saw what number it was. That number was 180 before sbin init comes out of the actual, actual root. So, during the init ramfs, we forked 180 times. Um, so that you know, by my little test there, that 180 forks is 180 milliseconds. And if you can get rid of those sorts of things, shell programming can help you, and you can do more with less. Um, and by the time you've gotten to rc.local, you know, I was at 1,059 forks. So <laughs> roughly, you know, a full second of boot to rc.local is spent. Forking, which is <laughs> pretty fun, kind of embarrassing. Yeah, <laughs> but that's actually you know that that is the kind of thing that drives somebody to make Linux fork just stupidly, amazingly mm -hmm. fast. I mean, you you could not accomplish if yeah. <laughs> you'd see that else you'd see that on another Unix and it'd be so bad that you you'd write it better. I guess is what amounts to. <laughs> Um, why else would you want you want to write something in shell? A lot of times I do things like this. Um, this is just kind of a blog post that I write, but you know I think documentation makes sense, especially well done. Or if you're writing things in shell, or if you're if you're writing things and you're expecting your users to to um, 
to interact with a shell anyway. Little bits of shell programming kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, here I, I use time format from the bash shell. Not a lot of shell there actually, but it, where, but you know, some places it, it makes sense to to do it and it and it fits well and then you can say you know grep and different things. And it, it, it demonstrates it is self-documenting, I guess, in a lot of ways. It allows you to easily show somebody how to do something. Um, yeah. Why else? Because bin, bin sh is ubiquitous. I mean, you find it on Open OpenWRT. You find it. I mean, really everywhere. The the thing that got me to using to writing shell scripts. I started when I was in college writing Perl and I was just amazed at how little, how, how much function you could get out of Perl in so little, right? And then I came to a place where I was needing to interact with something that just had BusyBox and there was no user in Perl. And so I, I, I learned how to use what's usually built into BusyBox, which is like awk and said. And, and fairly limited on yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I realized that, well, you can actually Accomplish most of what I was doing in Perl in sh, awk, and sed, and outside of hashes, you can you can get by, and then I just start. So I stopped using Perl and only started using sh, and then it's hard. And once you get well enough versed in what you're doing, it's hard to justify learning anything else. <laughs> but so um, is. From what you're saying, though, there's not a big difference hit between Bash and SH that. Um, it's it's not it's not terribly significant. It is significant. I mean, it was it was in that thing, you know, twice as slow, right? It, <laughs> that is significant. But and if you do something that. thousands of times, you'll notice you'll notice that thing. But just bringing it up was twice as slow. And then the the general interpreter is probably slower too. But and it's it's a more complex language that allows you to do so. There's more mm -hmm. you, the interpreter is more complex. Um, so the next part is turning your shell your shell script into a shell program. I had a friend, at, a colleague at IBM, who he he wrote a uh, a build tool in shell in Bash and. And he was annoyed that people would call it a bash script because he seems to think that he, the word script seems to have a connotation to it that says this is just a, you know, this isn't really well done. And so he, he implied it was a bash program. All of his documentation said, you know, it's a bash program, program written in bash. Um, and so I, I, I kind of take that and moving from what you consider a script to a program. And I, I do see the word script as being derogatory. But, but, um, so first, I put a lot of links in here so I could go to other things, but then they don't work in the browser mode. Um, let's see. Uh, programs have usage was something. I mean, it, the first thing you do if you run a program and you you know you want to type minus minus help. If you're writing a shell script, even oh, no matter how trivial it is, if you expect someone else to use it, or even yourself, tomorrow, usage is helpful, right? You, mm -hmm. you, <laughs> it's so you, so nice to run a program with my, myself and see something, because you're just not good. It's so much faster to comprehend than when you have to open it up and read source code um, if you actually want to use it as a tool. So put usage in your um, programs always do the, the thing I, I always do it like that that format which is um, pretty common. yeah and then using cats the, the here document and shell to do that um, let's see this is I use this thing called new script I mean every time I wrote a write a program because I so many times write write them and started from scratch every time I'd write one and not use a template like this. A couple days later, I'm like, why didn't I use that template? <laughs> <That's just laughs> then I end up rewriting the thing or adding it to it. I would so, think by now it's almost automatically. Yeah, 
So I mean, it, so the new script, so new script is this, like, um, I mean, it it is a shell program that I have that I have in my tilde bin that just creates a new file, creates a new template script. So foo, right? New script foo, wrote foo, and then foo has got my template in it, and I always put. I, I put my, I use a main and I use get opt. Those are some other things that, um, yeah. So get opt is is phenomenal for parsing options. Yeah. There's another one called I think it's get ops. It's actually a shell built in. I really prefer the usage semantics of get opt to get ops so much that I don't really even remember what it's called, but. Um, Get opt does incur a fork. It is an external program, but it's worth it. Um, so yeah, so this basically look, this is how you end up. This is how that stanza looks like. You end up using get opt, and then you walk through your options, and then you have some left over. Um, programs take arguments. If you're writing a shell script that you just expect to, you know, to take options and do things like that, use get opt. It's wonderful. Um, it, Allows you to, you know, more sanely add later on than adding another program, than adding another argument or adding another shell variable that you're going to forget about and it just gets messy. Try to write a program from the start; you'll thank yourself later. Um, let's see functions. Um, I think that this was to show use use functions. Um, and let's see, and use, and there's two ways that you can do things um, to kind of use return values out of functions. One is you can write the values to standard out, that's in like in greeting. Um, in, in greeting, I, I prefer the second because it doesn't incur a fork. See so, yeah, we had to, use, to, to get the output of that function up there, greeting on line 13, I, the greeting with SMOSER and I took the standard output of it and then write it. So that was a that was a fork, the shell fork, invoked that thing, took it standard out and put it in my buffer. And the second one though, it does not include a fork. So it's probably that little simple that little simple thing is probably on the order of a thousand times faster than the first one. You just if if you're looking to avoid fork and for a lot of things you can. I, I don't, a lot of people prefer or do all, all over the place the first form where you write something to standard out and you, you use the shell to capture the output. I don't, I try to avoid that where I can. Um, but use functions for all the reasons that you would use functions in a programming language. It, you know, they're reusable, they take parameters, they're, they're wonderful. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, that was a, that's a bad link. Uh, declare. Um, <coughs> declare variables. If you don't declare variables, um, yeah, in, in a shell, you, you're probably familiar that basically all your environment variables that exist become uh, variables, right? So the you know dollar sign home represents your slash home slash smoser and log name there would be smoser and those are just handed to you from the environment. Um, that's good for a lot of reasons. It's bad in others. Um, if you see if you see the bug here, um, I, I didn't initialize the very the <coughs> is root value to false or I didn't set it in this you're not root and then later on I look at it. Um, well if I run that program either intentionally or unintentionally with Intentionally or unintentionally, with is root true in my environment, which is what env does. It just adds it to my environment. Um, now it says, 
know, that first stanza said you're not root, but then later on I checked the value of is root and I found out that I am. So the fact that you get a bunch of environment of, of variables declared in your in your programming language is nice at first, but it's really dangerous. And you know, it's kind of like using an uninitialized variable in C. You know, it you it's a very easy mistake to make, and you just need to be careful that you declare your variables and set them to yeah, set them to the default values. Is there a switch or anything you can turn on to check that? You're like Pro has strict. You can. Strict. There is Someone one. Warn you if you're using uh, variables you didn't declare. There, there is something you can tell it to never let you reference uninitialized variables. Okay. Um, yeah, it's. I don't do it because it's painful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you I end up. I actually used it sometime, uh, like, you know, it's been. Uh, like when I was using it uh, continuously for about two years. Yeah. yeah. So then I had to look, uh, find something on this. But yeah. I hardly uh, recollect. Would you uh, emphasize upon that, like, uh, what, what's the keyword I got to? It's pride. Like, I need, I need to make a declaration, right? Yeah. Oh, declare, yeah. And you can declare. Um, that, that makes it an array. Yeah. Um, so you can, but there is a, yeah, you, there is a, uh, there's something in the, in bash and a shell that you can, I think it may only be bash though, it may not be classics that you can say, basically exit on attempts to use an uninitialized variable. I've tried it before, it's just kind of painful, and I, yeah, that's kind of I guess like compiling with, uh, you know, minus w pedantic or that sort of thing, it's, you, it, it, it's kind of over the top, but yeah, it is, it's there and it's a, it's a useful tool. Um, let's see. Um, set minus F is another thing. I, I think probably more than anything else that kind of when I look at somebody's shell code, the most common issue comes from this sort of logic, um, where you end up getting well set minus F. In a, or let's see, set plus f as the default. That um, means that you get shell expansion of variables, which I mean is what you use all the time when you use wonderful things like you know for a in star. Yeah, that's shell expansion of variables, right? And that's really nice. But um, but that that expansion. When it, get, when it comes into play when you don't want it to is so extremely painful and has so um, many unexpected results when, when you do something like I think that will do it, right? Right, did I get double? Yeah, there. So this first, yeah, so when you're debugging a shell script, and I, yeah, like as I'm walking, watching it, it doesn't even make any sense, right? But for A and star, do echo A. Well, there's actually a file named star. So the first file was A, was star, and then when I said echo star, that one shell expanded to this entire line. And then I went through the rest of them one by one. So you see such odd things, and to debug stuff like that is, is horrendous. Um, so, so if you did a set minus f right now. Yeah, uh, and I do that same over. thing. Set plus f. Okay. Oh, that minus f oh, doesn't right. do the expansion. Yeah. Right? Now I have sanity. Yeah. Um, ah. So in general, I most of the time try to operate with set minus f. With disable bash shell or shell expansion and uh, enable it when you need it. Is that shell expansion or file clubbing? Uh, file clubbing. Um, yeah, it, does that do tilde 2? Let's see. No, so tilde is, a, so it's not path name expansion, yeah, file clubbing, but it, 
also would do, yeah, I mean, you can just get a lot of weird stuff. And then if you've got, you know, file names with semicolons or carriage returns or the, it just gets really ugly. And so in general, yeah, sorry, there's, there's that. And then in general, just always quote variables because I would have been safe also if I had done this. Set my set plus F. This is also safe, I think. Except for ready to go. There was left over the previous one. That's also same. And so a lot of times, yeah. most of the time when you see programs, ish, problems in people's programs, they're either set minus F, <laughs> shell expansion, got them, or um, they need more quotes. You read that bash. Ex advanced ship scripting handbook and like it throughout it says use more quotes that's generally the problem um, as I said before I like get opt negative logic is something that if you I don't know if that's really a great term for it but um, if you're if you're trying to program defensively I guess Look at those two programs. One of them, let's see. Yeah, one of them takes a the happy path if it's not equal to one, and one takes it if it's equal to one. And when you call it with, if you give it some variable that is not a digit, it's doing digit comparison, then the if bracket will fail and take the negative path. So in this case, yeah, the first one's broken, not because of any reason other than it got bad input. But you take the yep number, number was one path here, show it. it might be hard to... Is that... Yeah, so... And that would have right. fixed that, but essentially, if, the way that it works is that I mean, that's just any probe, any reason that thing exits non true, you take the false path. And so, you want to basically go through and be very careful about taking that. You, you want to only take the happy path, yeah. and certain okay. things are happy and happy and happy. Yeah. Um, uh, so, tips basically, I I rarely go further than sh set and awk, and if I find that I've used some set of any of those that don't exist in um, BusyBox, then I rework it to work in BusyBoxes. It's kind of lowest common denominator thing, and I just since the environments that I've been work that I often work in are or basically a, a minimalistic uh, in it or in, in minimal minimalistic system, so. What do you think of Busy Box? Busy Box? Um, we could do a whole presentation on that. So. Yeah, it's it's neat. Um, it's a multi-call binary that is basically the, if you've used embedded Linux or touched an embedded Linux, Busy Box was there. It's, it's a single binary. Um, that implements, well, awk, set, sh, um, wc, basically uh, almost so all standard Unix. Yeah, uh, last time I looked at yeah, it. It's an interesting thing commands. because this name matches uh, with the uh, other uh, things, right? So, I mean, this is a server uh, <coughs> powered by something. So by what is this uh, busy box problem? You will find it if you've got you have a if you've got a DWRT router or a, an embedded Linux on anywhere. Actually, it, probably in your pocket if you've got Android. I'm guessing yeah. there's a busy box on there. Um, it is pretty much like here's all that I ran. Yeah. So busy boxes provides me with you. You can use all of those commands. In a, in a single binary, and the reason it's 
so I think it's that one's yeah that one's even static. Wow, I wouldn't have thought it was static, but okay. Well, well if you're using it, it's, it's it makes a lot of sense to be static. But um, I thought that the one that came in the distro by default was not it's just too big. And then yeah, Roughly. so yeah. We used it with LTSP and just stripped out most of the stuff yeah. because we were sucking the init ram fs off the network. We wanted as small as we could. Yeah. Yeah. All the, all of them, all like, we package onto the. It does all of that in that same in that one binary. All that functionality. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the packaging technology is some good. Yeah. It's, it's all yeah. It's, it's all inside there. It's all just a what. It's a multi call. It looks at the. It looks at the dollar. You know the, the R zero. The name that it's called with. It takes different behaviors based on, on all of it. But basically, it's a fully embedded Linux system, and you can have nothing but BusyBox and come up with Linux and yeah. be quite well, reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. The one that goes in the Internet Ram FS is not statically linked because it would be wasteful to be statically linked because it has other things that pull TMC in. So by default, that's just, that would just be waste. But yeah. Um, yeah, because then you have the code in BusyBox and right. in the libraries and other things. Um, let's see. So yeah, so those are the those are the tools I try to stick to. I mean, you see a lot of people use cut and gosh, I, I did a lot of different things. Most of the time, I just I stick with those three things. They can do just about anything. Awk is a fully is a full another interpreted language in yeah. itself, and it's another, another yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's a very nice fully programmable language in itself, and it comes up fast too. Um, let's see, you clean up. I, I do this set of snippets. It's in that new script thing. I do that all the time. Um, almost all my programs that use a temporary file anywhere, I just make a temporary directory. And then trap exit is, um, is anytime the shell exits, it's going to run clean, clean up. Mm -hmm. And then you check for that. And R minus and then clean up your temporary directory. No, it's I'm important. It's very important that you. Um, very important that you initialize tempd in that case because if you didn't initialize it and this and say this didn't happen until later and you call cleanup then you can and somebody else had sent their tempd outside of that the environment variable would trash their directory for you so that's an example of you need to initialize variables <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I yeah so I use that that little sn snippet a, a lot of times and I use that and, and trap is another useful thing. Um, May I have your attention? The time is now 8:30 and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. So you can, Please be advised that the internet connections will shut down approximately 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. So you can trap on a, no, a number of different things and one of them is um, essentially a, a control C from the user event. So. It, uh, a well a well behaved program, you know, you expect a well behaved program to do control C to take the same output to clean up its temporary directories to do whatever. And you can you can do that with shell just like you can do it with Python or Perl or C traffic signals. It's it's important that that makes a much better program so you don't you know end up with a bunch of slew of temp fair files left around with your temporary data in it. it just generally it's part of programming and So why would you want to use Bash instead of just POSIX shell? Um, Bash has real arrays. They're, that is the number one reason that I end up going to Bash instead of shell. Um, there's, an, there's an example of using one. You can actually, like that my array, if you try to do that in POSIX shell, iterating over those, you know, that something with spaces in it that is, you know, a, a string with spaces in it as a single entry, or if that entry had, you know, non-friendly shell characters in it, um, things just get ugly. So the number one reason I go to Bash is as soon as I need to use an array for something. Um, it's also fairly clean, like it looks nice to declare that variable like that. It, the syntax is nicer than a list with just the strings and then you echo it to get rid of its 
programmatically looks reasonable. Um, the way you add an item to an array is kind of weird. <laughs> what that says is my, you know, my array sub the current length of my array <laughs> equal this. Oh, the pound sign is the correct length. Yeah, that's the length of the array. Okay. Oh, well, pound my array. Yeah, I mean this it does get kind of a yeah. pound my array sub at. And oh, is that yeah, means all of the elements, zero. and it counts the it counts all the, the so, there, so there's not a push. Yeah. yeah. It, yes, that is push essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can also do it like it's even more uh, obvious what you're doing if you do. Let's see. Oops. Uh, because I declared it as associate. So that's an array X. Um, you can also do X. This is probably has more overhead to it. Oh, that just looks pretty. Of ABC. Yeah, and it and essentially <laughs> reinitializes itself with the previous contents. Right. Um, if you were a Lisp programmer, you probably wouldn't like that. Hmm. Um, let's see. In, Another nice thing in Shell is there in Bash is that you can actually do string replacement without using set. Yes. Um, so that that's the syntax for string string replacement. So that would be slash home, i.e. smoser instead of home smoser. Um, just replace the e with i.e. Well, I guess, and that does it globally because there's two slashes. For it. Um, Bash has in Bash four, which is pretty much everywhere at this point, I think. Maybe RHEL doesn't have Bash 4 at this point, I don't know. You can use hashes and associative arrays. Generally, I think, generally is when I get to need that, I go to Python or RHEL 7. I would think it would, it probably does. Um, once I need, so as soon as I need associative arrays, I usually leave the shell and go to Python. Um, bash pipe status is nice. This is something you, Huh? You've got to switch or yeah. release it on. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to go to another one. Yeah. Um, this is an example of, and this is a common gotcha that people get. Um, let's see. Pipe fail is a nice feature of Bash that just basically says if anything, um, yeah. So in that count lines, you can see lines equal cap. This file does not yeah. exist. Private at wc minus l. Yeah. And then I check and I check the return code. Well, the return code in POSIX shell and in bash by default is the return code of the last item in the pipeline. Yeah. So wc minus l happily counted nothing and returned true. And then I take the happy path of the, there were there were blank lines in this. Yeah, I'll show you the I'll run that and show you what it looks like, but. Um, so that's a common gotcha. The set minus o pipe fail fixes it. Let's see. Why are you piping? No good reason. Just to show that. Just to show that. Yeah, that particular set of things. There's no good reason, but yeah, there's plenty of great reasons to pipe. Yeah. So, and then bash pipe status. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Um, and then bash bash pipe status shows the actually you can look at each one of them it, it will show you oh, each element of pipe yeah so if I said yeah actually so that should have done something But yeah, you basically can see each element of the pipe. You get the return code of each el of the element of a pipe. Um, occasionally, I'll use dollar sign random and dollar sign seconds. Dollar sign seconds is useful for timing things, simple timing. That shell has been up for 8,162 seconds. I can do. That should be somewhere higher. Yeah. 
basically the magic variable seconds counts how many seconds the shell's been up. So it's it's useful for timing, just because it's built in automatic. Um, yeah, I wanted to I meant it to go to let's see. The other thing that you'll see in show useless use of cat. <laughs> <laughs> Use a cat word. A lot of times you'll see that sort of thing where people will will cat a file into grep and grep can clearly take the file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of like so, you're oh, yeah. into like uh, I did that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I did that. I was trying to find a pro uh, a way to yeah. use a file, but yeah. yeah. File into more. Uh huh. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's about all I've got. Um, Anybody have any questions? Generally, it, it's got its place. Shell has its place. Um, it, there are prettier languages, and and Shell yeah. is full yeah. of gotchas in a lot of ways. But it, it does accomplish certain needs. And, yeah. and for cases where it's sitting between you and the and a failing machine or a failing node, it's nice. Mm -hmm. What's up? I love the show program. Um, I see your slides. Are your slides and your examples? Um, the everything's there. Yeah, yeah, everything's there. So, yeah, I mean, if you that's probably enough. Yeah. Well, that's my LAC talk. But yeah, if you look at my GitHub, you can find it, and then I, I'll get them to the. So they can get on the website there too. But yeah. Thank you. avoiding dangers. Huh? Avoiding dangers. Avoiding. Yeah. Avoiding. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like the things I said, just it, it, initializing variables and just being generally careful in defensive programming. Those are things that. In any programming language, you need say, to kind yeah. of be aware of, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, a couple weeks. Let's see. It's probably, it's been a couple months. I actually shot a. I was I was working on an insta installation tool, and this was actually in Python. Okay, but it's a it's a program that installs an, an Ubuntu root file system onto a disk, and then tries to make it boot and reboot into it, right? And so, under like, root Python is not that complex. Huh? It's uh, highly complex uh, as such, I don't, because I've seen people like trying to make web services with, uh, I know hardly you know, that we are, uh, like people write web services even much simpler with Python. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, I, I have a program called Curtain that is an installer for, it's a, the fast path installer for Ubuntu. And I was running it on a, on a system I thought I was running on a different system and installing to dev SDB, and I was running on, my, on, I ran it on a different system than I thought, and so I actually trashed the, the disk underneath, that was part of an LVM of the root file system. I forcefully like formatted it while it was, while LVM was on it and the root was there, and then put data, and then even copied data onto it. I was flat out amazed at how well, I don't even understand it, but I was able to SSH into the system and I copied off all of my home and all of everybody else's data. We didn't end up losing any data, oh, but the, the disk was completely gone. I, I had trash, you know, volume running. It had a lot of RAM. It had a lot of RAM, but stuff, cache, yeah, yeah, but, and then it wouldn't reboot. And it, I'm like, no. it was it was gone to the world, but. Yeah. So anyway, you can be you can be stupid in any language in any way, you know. Yeah. Under history, uh, what about the, the old shells? Z shell, K shell, T shell? They, um, any of them still around, or are they all gone? Z shells newer. Yeah, Z I, Z shell. I think some people use it. I, I don't think you probably see a lot of people programming in Z shell. I think it is a you know. Unless you're brick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as a syntactic, as a, as an, I think it's more of a human interface, it has you know goodies than it does programming. I, I don't really think a lot of people would use it for that perspective. 
I sure is, I sure wouldn't use corn shell, but yeah, or CSH. I don't know why. I mean, CSH is awesome. I don't know why people. What is CSH? Yeah, as a shell. Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. I think it's got syntactic stuff. It's it's got a learning curve that I don't need to overcome. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.